Uh, welcome everyone to the scaling up a modern digital business to reach a million users topic by Sneha Prabhu, a marketing delivery partner at and Archana Ravi Kumar, lead engineer BCG Digital Ventures. Without further ado, over to you, Archana. Uh, hi everyone, really nice to see everybody joining us today, this afternoon to talk about uh, scaling digital platforms. Um, it's yet another Zoom call uh, where you're all going to pretend that you don't know I'm wearing uh, track pants under the shirt, but it is what it is. So thanks for joining us. Um, uh, like mentioned, I'm uh, Achna, I'm a lead engineer. I've been in the industry for around 12 years and I've had experience working in different technologies and different domains, building platforms. Uh, prior to working at DCG Digital, Digital Ventures, um, I used to work with Sneha at ThoughtWorks Technologies. And what we're going to share today is our learnings and experiences uh, uh, while building a platform for a client of ThoughtWorks. Um, over to you, Sneha. Hi, Sachna. My name is Sneha. Uh, I uh, play the role of market delivery partner, which essentially means that I support a lot of our clients based in Southeast Asia and Australia and ensure that we can deliver from, uh, from ThoughtWorks India. Uh, and um, thank you all for joining us uh, in, like Archana said, yet another Zoom call uh, where it feels like somebody's going on and on and uh, we have no idea because none of you are on video. We don't know if you're able to understand us or uh, have any reactions. Uh, so it just feels like what we're saying is going into ether. So please do keep the chat and uh, Q&A coming so that we know what you're thinking. Um, so um, Archana and I are very lucky. We've had the chance to work together on a lot of different projects. Uh, and we're here to talk to you today about scaling digital platforms, something that we've done a fair bit of in the last few years. And we have lots of takeaways from those experiences. Uh, and we worked on one such platform together, which is uh, for an insurtech company, uh, which we will refer to a lot today as our example. Um, and Archana will set some context on this platform in just a little bit. Now, the idea of modern digital businesses is not new, and I'm sure you're all familiar with them. Um, in my mind, I think of all digital businesses as being one of two types. They're either Digital natives like Amazon that started as a digital first business, they didn't move from an offline model to an online model. They started off as a digital company. Um, and then there's those businesses that have been in the industry for a long time, they excel in their respective fields and they likely have a lot of physical assets. They have a physical presence and engagement with their customers. Um, and because of the threat of being overtaken by the digital native disruptors, they need to urgently ensure that they move to a digital model uh, in order to continue to survive. But wanting to survive may not be the only driver to turn to um, digital. Um, in order to reach millions more users, a uh, digital platform is often the right way to go, which is why we're talking to you about scaling platforms today. Our example platform uh, that we refer to a lot today is the one that we built for a digital first company, uh, which was built to disrupt a very traditional business, the insurance industry. And you all have heard of digital transformation, I'm sure, even a, maybe a little bit too much. Uh, in our minds, digital, digital transformation is the journey that a company undertakes to transform a traditionally run business uh, to a digital business. Uh, and the most common example of this, which also I'm sure you've heard too many times, is, uh, is Netflix. Um, so they're a company that started out as you know, a physical service, um, and their service was to mail out physical videos to their customers. Um, and the competition also uh, offered very similar service. Uh, what Netflix did very cleverly was to rapidly move to a, to a digital business model by leveraging you know, technology in the form of streaming that was available to not just change the game entirely, but to also reach millions more customers than they could before, like you and me. Um, and their biggest competitor, Blockbuster, did not move fast enough, and eventually they went out of business. So every business today is either trying to survive or is urgently trying to scale so that they can capture a much larger segment um, of the market. Like I said, we're going to be talking to you today about um, an insurtech uh, platform that we built, and we'll use this as an example um, to share our learnings. And Ashna, could you um, share a little bit about our example? Of course. Um, thanks, Neha. So like Sneha mentioned, a lot of the premise for the stock is based on our experience working for an insurance startup in Singapore. Um, so they were a traditional uh, insurance company, like Sneha mentioned. So um, you know they started off by being a brokerage firm. Uh, but they also were like smart enough to understand the power of technology and to be able to leverage that to deliver a digital platform. So the business model when they started off was very simple. Uh, so they were providing group insurance to employees of different companies. Um, 
they had been in the market for about three years. They had 600 to 700 uh, companies on their portfolio, like small, medium enterprises, also called SMEs on their portfolio. Um, and they had about 7,000 end users on the platform. So it was a pretty good journey for them. Um, so what they realized was that in order to provide a differentiator for themselves in the market, um, they wanted to kind of give the power of choice for insurance back to the customers. So, you know, they wanted to be able to allow, so they noticed that in the market, there were different types of users for insurance. So if it's someone who's just starting out their career and they are like super fit or they don't have any known health issues, then they might want to use their insurance money to be proactive about their health and not reactively cover it using insurance. So something like a gym subscription or a benefit package or a healthy meal subscription was something that would be more useful to such a person. Whereas someone who had like a history of health issues or who had dependents to take care of would be more interested in a comprehensive insurance coverage. So they saw that there was this difference in how users approach insurance. And there's obviously like a lot of money on the table when users don't use their package, right? Um, so they wanted to build a platform that would give the power back to the users. But where they were, they were still pretty much a brokerage firm uh, with the digital platform. So they did have a few issues on their plate. Um, so in their traditional brokerage model, they were still going after the clients. So they would, you know, do a lot of outbound calls to reach out to these SMEs to sell the platform to them. And each of these calls, in addition to the sales cycle, also had like a lot of operational overhead because, um, you know, the time taken to onboard an SME was also about um, four to six weeks because of how the platform was set up. Um, and so um, they were facing quite high operational overhead and they understood that they had to kind of reduce this to be able to go faster and build this like uh, vision they had of giving the choice back to the users. Um, another um, thing that they had, which kind of differentiated them from the competitors at that point, but which also put a constraint on how fast they can evolve, was that the, they had a promise to deliver a bespoke product to each one of their customers. So, you know, um, clients could come in with different requirements and they had a platform which was sort of geared to deliver on these requirements. So for example, um, they built a generic platform with a lot of configurations that were stored in the database. Um, and so when I say configurations, it's uh, for customizations like, you know, your basic uh, look and feel, like what the website's going to look like. Um, the SME's brand or logo should be shown on the UI, which is pretty standard, like white labeling uh, requirements, they were able to meet those, but they were also able to um, even do like complex customization for business logic. What page should a user land on? Or another example is, um, so when you join a company, you would get insurance uh, coverage from the company, right? Uh, but depending on when you join in the financial year, your coverage would be prorated. And there would be some industry standard uh, based on the geography of how the proration would work. Um, but when a large SME was brought in, they said that for their employees, they wanted the coverage to be prorated on a half yearly basis which was different from like the standard monthly proration that was in place. So then this had to be made like a configuration that was stored in the database. And, you know, so the logic changes and how the uh, users interact with the application changes. So they had like a, this bespoke product, which was slowly becoming a monster that was really hard to manage and maintain. And because all the configurations were in the database, uh, the UI took like a lot of time to render. So it was actually poor customer experience also. And then the last thing that they had was that uh, because of how their evolution had been, they had traditionally been a company where business leads technology. So a lot of business requirements would get thrown at the engineering team and they would like scramble to build a product, um, which meant that uh, the engineering team had like no breathing space to think about how to make the platform better, how to like, you know, build for the future vision. Um, so some of the things like slow onboarding time, four to six weeks was because, you know, like all these configurations had to be added. You have to test them, make sure it doesn't break for anybody else. A lot of it was manual. Um, and so it took like quite a long time to onboard these users. Sometimes the uh, clients would say, hey, how do we know what it would look like eventually? And so we had to like build a POC, show it to them and, you know, make sure they were happy before they could be brought on board and so on. So they, they were facing quite a lot of problems, but they really wanted to be a true digital disruptor in the market, which is kind of the time we came in. So um, we worked with them. And then fast forward to like 11 months later, uh, we had worked together to build like a new set of things. So where we ended up was um, we changed the business model and we uh, launched a new model called a distribution model, 
which had reduced cost of sales and reduced operational cost. We will, Sneha will talk about this a little bit in detail in one of the upcoming slides, but uh, essentially we just changed the model so that we didn't have to go after these small medium enterprises anymore, but instead we could sell the platform to larger companies who would then take care of selling it downstream to small companies or to end users directly. So when I talk about distribution clients, these are large companies like banks, like Standard Chartered or um, one of those companies who then became customers of the startup. Um, then they also kind of changed their mindset of being like a traditional brokerage firm and they started thinking and acting like a product company. Um, we built a platform as a product. So it was a platform on the cloud. And so we were pretty brutal about making sure that the requirements were unified. They were not, a, it was not a very generic product. Um, there was still possibility of configuration, but only things that made sense. And so we unified requirements as much as possible. We reduced and kept the configuration to a minimum. We removed it from the database. We made it like a environment configuration. So it was easier to like uh, figure it out. And the platform didn't like have poor performance because of configuration in the database. Um, but in case a new user, a new client came in and asked for like highly custom configuration, we would not turn them away. Instead, we just asked them to pay a premium for that configuration so that the you know effort justified the cost and so on. And finally, I think both tech and business, they started like working hand in hand with each other. They really understood like the power of collaboration um, and business understood like the power of having tech on board right from the start so that, you know, we could work creatively on some of these problems like reducing the onboarding time. And for some of the smaller clients, uh, we started rolling out like a self-service model where the clients can kind of choose what they wanted. And it was automated till the end without the need for like manual configuration, manual testing and so on. Um, so it was a pretty interesting journey uh, over a period of 11 months. And I'll now pass over to Sneha to talk about how we started, where we started, how we ended up here and what our journey was like. So we worked on this platform for 11 months and we brought it to a point where it could rapidly scale to more than a million users. Um, and we learned a lot from this journey. But the overarching lesson for us that we took away from it um, is that this journey is never linear. Um, there isn't a clear set of stages that we can call out, right? That have to go one after the other. Uh, but a lot of different things have to happen in parallel. It just can't be sequential. Uh, and also a lot of this can't be templated. Um, you know, I, I can't abstract our experience into a set of steps that you can follow in your context and expect the same results. But so much is dependent on the context of the industry that you're operating in, the context of the organization you are today and the kind of organization you want to become uh, and much more. So there is no silver bullet to making this work, unfortunately. Uh, and so we're not going to try and share like a magical formula with you um, here today. Uh, what we do want to share, though, are some principles that we've taken away that we think are relevant in many different contexts. Um, and so we thought that these principles are a little bit profound. So from now onwards, we start to use some profound images in our slides. Um, Arshan, next one, please. Um, so we'll start with how we helped our client um, shift their focus to what users actually want. Now, all of us, I'm sure, have insurance providers, uh, but we don't like to interact with them very much, right? We, we actually hope we won't have too many medical situations where we have to work with our insurance providers a lot, and we're hoping we don't have to work with them. Um, so they're not a business that you want to keep engaging with, uh, but that's not a great place to be if you're an insure tech business that wants to scale and wants to be an essential part of their users' lives. Um, so what we started to do was to shift the positioning of this business to shift the focus from being an insurance provider to being a company that helps users focus on their health and wellness instead. Um, so we believe that this is something that users cared about a lot more. Um, and so we started to build the platform out as a, as a health product where users can go in and they can go through a health assessment through a fairly intelligent um, questionnaire uh, and we give them a health score. Uh, and then we'd give them you know, tips and content to help them improve their health scores. So the idea was that you know, we gamify this enough that they'd want to keep coming back and checking if their score has gotten better. Right? Um, and uh, this would also you know, lead customers into the, uh, into the organization shop, which is the purchase flow, where um, users could buy health products or gym subscriptions or meal subscriptions or whatever it is that the app recommends based on their health score, uh, which will help them improve it. Um, and if, despite all of this preventative care that they're taking of themselves, if they still need to use their insurance, they could still have their claims processed to the app. 
right? So while they're at heart still an insurance company providing insurance that can be used for many different purposes, they ensured that they were putting the focus on preventative healthcare, uh, proactively improving health, so that users are much more likely to engage continuously and would like to do so uh, rather than you know using it as something that they don't have um, you know an option um, to do. So that's uh, that's us trying to understand what the users actually want and being built and being able to build for them rather than what the business wants. Um, now let's imagine for a moment that you are the. Um, I think we've skipped the slide, uh, Archana. Uh, let's imagine for a moment that you're the publisher of a of a newspaper and you're distributing this newspaper yourself. Um, you can probably distribute to at the most maybe your neighborhood if you were doing it by yourself. Um, and if you want to increase the reach of this newspaper, what you might do is then hire a bunch of delivery guys, right? Um, and that's exactly what we did with this uh, insurance business. Um, instead of having to onboard each smaller, medium-sized business uh, and sell the product to them, uh, what we did was create a new layer of consumers. Uh, and Ashna was referring to them earlier. They, these are the people that we called the distributors. Uh, and what we did was to create a platform that will help them distribute the product to uh, multiple other um, customers. Um, so now this customer, this distributor is generally somebody who's a very large organization, maybe a bank, maybe a telecom company, who already has a relationship with many small and medium businesses. And by, you know, uh, by function of that, also a relationship with all of their employees. So for example, I work at ThoughtWorks um, and we're, a, you know, we're 3,000 people in India. Um, and I... Uh, 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 my salary account is with Standard Chartered because ThoughtWorks already has a relationship with Standard Chartered, right? So uh, if this insurance company was trying to sell to ThoughtWorks, the sales cost would be really high because if you sell to multiple ThoughtWorks and with each sale, they get about 3,000 users. Um, whereas selling to Standard Chartered gives them access to so many more organizations and as a result, so many more employees, tens of thousands more people through one sale. Um, so the idea was really to leverage, you know, those relationships that they already had and what's in it for a bank like Standard Chartered? You know, it's, it's just that they could then use this application. You know, it's white labeled um, and uh, is branded with their uh, organization's uh, uh, branding, uh, so that it they can now start to offer um, something else that they can cross sell along with salary accounts to a company like ThoughtWorks. Right? They can now actually offer insurance uh, as a product to the same customers that they already have previous relationships with, um, and so. You know, often when we think about expansion, uh, we think about uh, engaging a customer segment that we didn't previously engage. But rather than that, if we engage a customer layer whose reach is, you know, can multiply our own, uh, it's often a much better move to make in order to scale. Uh, next one, please, Archana. Uh, something to keep in mind when we're talking about scaling a business is to note that, you know, until this point, the business has clearly done something right, right? If they're ready to scale now, they've you know, they have had a good idea, they've validated that idea, they have a clear business model, uh, they have a pretty good customer base, uh, and that's why right now they're primed for scale. Um, and it's important to, you know, continue to keep the business running and to keep that customer base happy and unaffected by new changes that we're making, right? Um, so it's important for the team that is focused on growth to not operate outside of this ecosystem, but to actually work with the business priorities, right? If, if the priority is to keep the lights on, to keep these customers happy and to keep adding value to them, we've got to continue to do that and adapt that into our roadmap. Um, and for the InsurTech business example, it was important for us to keep the business running and at the same time acquire at least one such massive distributor, a standard chartered kind of distributor, so that we can validate the concept of the distribution business model before we started to invest more in it. So as a product team, this was something we had to keep in mind that there is going to be two sets of customers that we need to keep, one that we have to keep happy and unaffected and the other which, where we're trying to validate a new idea. Um, next one, please, Archana. Um, very early in this uh, project, we started to put together a roadmap, uh, but before it, we started to create a lean value tree, um, starting with, you know, articulating a very clear vision for the platform, right? The leadership of this company, their vision was to be able to expand and influence employees to take control of their own health and in turn, take care of their family's health and in turn, improve the nation's health, right? Um, so the founder's long-term vision was to ensure that Asians uh, are able to prevent common health issues like heart disease and obesity just by you know, enabling people to take control of their health and take pre uh, preventative health care. Um, we started from this vision because we thought it was a grand vision. It was, uh, it was, it was, a, it was a good one. Uh, and then we started to break this down into goals, which is what you do with the lean value tree. Uh, and we broke this down to goals that mapped to user segments, right? For us, 
the biggest target segment was the employees who will avail of the insurance uh, services at the end of the day. Uh, but there's also, of course, different types of employees. So we had to uh, understand different personas and do a bunch of research to really understand you know, their needs and their behavior. Um, and then uh, we started to put down goals, right? Goals for those users, not our goals, not the business's goals, but the goals that those users have. Uh, for example, an employee's goal might be uh, that they want to be aware of the status of their health, right? So that they can decide what they want to actually do to improve their lifestyle or or what they want to maintain as is. Um, so we put measures of success on each of these goals so that we can track whether, you know, what we're building is actually helping them make progress towards that goal. Um, for example, you know, how often a user engages with the application to check their health score uh, might be a measure uh, that we keep in mind, right? That's something that we track. Uh, we might also check um, if they're able to make positive changes every time they come back to the health score, has their health score changed positively? That might be a measure. Uh, another example might be, are, are they able to make consistent changes um, to their health score, right? Is it moving in a positive direction, but is it also sustainable? Right? So these were some measures of success we could put on that user's goals. Um, and that helped us then come up with hypotheses. If we were to help uh, you know, this user get to a goal, what might we build in order to get them there, right? So an example of a hypothesis might be um, that you know, we believe that um, allowing people to, to take a health assessment and see the health score will help them engage with the application more often. It's a very measurable thing. Uh, it's something that we can build a feature for and see if, you know, it actually works. And if it doesn't work, um, it's okay because we can backtrack very easily. The delta of change is so small that we learn from this experience, we backtrack and we do the next thing, which is the next initiative. Um, and so this way, uh, you know, we're able to build a very dynamic roadmap, right? That's what the Lean, lean Value Tree uh, helps us do is to not have to set a roadmap in stone at the start of this journey and then follow it to the T, right? Because a lot of things change along the way and you learn a lot about what users really want, right? Um, so a Lean Value Tree structure helps us keep that vision intact, but also helps us be flexible on what we build in order to get there. And, uh, and what's critical about that is then you, you know, develop an experimental mindset, which is exactly what you want in order to make this so dynamic. Uh, yeah. Uh, so when we start talking about experimentation, I think uh, at that point, it kind of becomes uh, the owners of the engineering team to start thinking about what are the tools and frameworks that we need to put in place to enable our product team to run these experiments that Sneha was talking about, to be able to uh, have a roadmap that is so dynamic and is able to adapt and pivot as the user's needs change and evolve, right? Um, so for that effect, uh, what you're looking at here is a classic build, measure, learn cycle. So we did something very similar. Um, our whole platform was built and deployed on Azure, but all the cloud providers, major cloud providers like GCP, AWS, and Azure have comparable features, so it doesn't matter. Um, but we used Azure, and then we started using Firebase Analytics to start tracking our user behavior and metrics. Uh, but again, there are comparable tools on each one of these platforms. There's other tools like Segment um, and others, which you can also use to start tracking your user behavior and other product metrics. Um, by looking at this data, we started like being able to visualize how the users are interacting with the system, and that gave us like immense learnings about what are the things uh, that the users need to see more of. Um, but in order to um, in order to enable rapid experimentation, right, we needed to have a path of being able to release features very rapidly into production, but also very confidently. So we started using uh, feature toggles. Uh, developers in the audience who uh, have been working in the industry for a few years would definitely already know what feature toggles are, uh, but they're just like a very simple mechanism that enables you to choose selectively what features to enable or disable on production. Traditionally, we've used these to, um, you know, uh, if you're building a new page or a new feature, let's say, you could enable it on uh, test environments, but you could turn it off on production. So until you are happy with what you've built, you can choose to turn it off on production. And once it's ready and tested, you can enable it and users will start seeing it. Um, so you could use something as simple as a feature toggle framework, um, which can also be, you know, just configuration in your uh, code base, or it could use a sophisticated framework like Firebase Remote Config or AWS App Config. Uh, but end of the day, the idea is that you just use configuration to intelligently decide what features your users are going to see. But you could also extend it a little bit um, and use tools like LaunchDarkly or others, uh, which help you do like um, 
roll out features to an experimental set of users maybe like you know the users who are more savvy or who you who are more used to the platform to kind of get like early feedback on what you're doing and how it is faring with the users so one example is that we found that uh, when we started um, using the platform more and we started tracking user data we realized that uh, in the old uh, platform users were traditionally using the platform just to file claims which was on like the last day of the month which was the deadline for claims and that is when there was like a lot of traffic on the platform and that's when we saw like issues arise and you know peak usage happen uh, we also saw that uh, some of the health features that Sneha was talking about we could see like how users were using it and whether like uh, the gamification helped and if that attracted more user traffic or not depending on that we could you know choose to fine-tune our flow and get more users on board it um, once this was in place uh, we actually had to deal with the actual platform itself and there was this like small little problem of the existing platform not scaling fast enough um, so what you're seeing here is a comparison of like the before and after. So they, uh, the team, the startup team had started by building a monolith, and which was the right decision to make at that point, right? So maybe before I go into details of the slide, I should like put a giant disclaimer. Uh, microservices are great, but I think the usage of microservices, they're not a silver bullet for all problems. And so the usage of microservices depends a lot on the maturity of the org to be able to deal with like the infrastructure requirements and CI CD requirements. And also whether it's really like, uh, it has good ROI for the amount of work you're going to put into Carbio or platform into services, right? But there is also a point in time in the life cycle of many startups that I've seen where they are ready to scale, the business is ready to scale and the platform is unable to scale. And that is usually a good indicator of at least having to break it down into smaller components that are more manageable. So for this company, the problems that we were seeing firsthand was that um, like we had some anecdotal evidence that when 7,000 users were onboarded and about like 80% or 90% of those users were trying to use the platform, it started to crash. And it's not really because the platform didn't crash because of the monolith, but because it was a monolith, it was hard to understand what the problem was and fix it. The other thing that we noticed firsthand was that uh, in developers were really scared to make changes in the platform because they didn't know if I change this line of code, I don't know what else was break, will break. And that was the state of their mind, right? So if you're at the verge of like a product vision that wants you to go faster and faster, but you are stuck with this platform that is making you really feel less confident about the changes you're making, then it is time to break it down. So we broke it down into a series of microservices. What you see on the right side here is the services that we had. You can see the contrast in the number of lines of code. So we went from like a million lines of code to services having like um, a few thousand lines of code, right? Um, we did retain like one uh, in insurance engine from the old monolith. I'll talk about it later. Uh, but the rest of the services were pretty small, which meant that we could add features fast. We could make developers owners of each one of these services so they knew what was happening. And the number of issues that we found on production drastically reduced but even if there was an issue um it didn't it wasn't very hard to fix it like our recovery time was quite low um but this is an example of what we did by breaking down a monolith to a microservice but depending on the platform that you're working on maybe your services are okay maybe it is a front end that needs to be broken down maybe micro front end is the pattern that you need to go after so it depends on what your problem at hand is um, and so you should just uh, take the context into consideration before deciding. Uh, so once we had like a platform of microservices, we were going fast and we were able to experiment and launch new features. We really needed to start thinking about what would we do in case there are any issues. Um, if you're having a platform that reaches a few thousand users and your reaction recovery times are pretty low, it's okay. Maybe it's okay, you can deal with it. But if you're building a platform to reach a million users, then you need to think about uh, observability, monitoring, and recovery with a different lens. Um, so there's a really good book called Accelerate, which talks about like four key engineering metrics that one should look at. And one of the metrics there is mean time to recover uh, or failure rate, uh, like recovery rate from failures, right? Uh, so the idea is that, uh, so where, where they were when they started, it was like, um, so we roll, the uh, developers would roll out a feature into production. Um, they go for a few months. We don't know who's using the feature, whether it's being used or not, if there's any feedback. Then suddenly the end users using the feature would find some bug. Maybe something's not working as expected or the system's crashing. 
and they would raise a bug report which wouldn't actually directly come to the developers it would go to the call center because they'd call up the call center and the call center folks would then reach out to the developers then the developers had to debug figure out where the problem was fix it and then release a fix to production this is a big cycle um and then if you think about it uh, one step more um if you have a release process and you know you're set up to go live only once in three uh, four to six weeks then no matter when the issue is found it's going to take at least another three to four weeks to push the release uh, fix out right uh, but in a platform that's rapidly evolving that's a no-go so we actually doubled down and focused on some of the tools that will improve observability and traceability for us so we started using um, uh, grafana tools like grafana sentry to start looking at uh, what are the issues happening so at any point in time we could have a snapshot of how the system is behaving and also how the users are behaving how many api calls are made how are the users interacting with the system and so on um we hadn't set up alerts but that was in our roadmap so you know if anything is going above or below threshold then we set up alerts so the engineers would get notified they can look at it immediately we also focused a lot on traceability to make sure that because especially in a framework of microservices you need to be able to know which service has the problem and so traceability was very key and we doubled down on that also um we leveraged automated testing a lot we made sure that our testing was very robust so we had all the components front end and back end components had about 90% test coverage at least and then on top of that we had api tests on top of that we had some higher level integration tests we also had automated ui tests which would test um if the automated ui tests were not exhaustive but they would test like the critical path of the flow so that we had at least confidence that the end user will be able to use our product without any issue like the flow that 90% of the users use we tested to make sure that that was okay so you know every comment that was made would go through this pipeline of tests if anything failed then the build would fail but everything passed then that meant that that was a suitable build that we could potentially launch to production one other thing we did was like from day one we set the path to production like we de defined and dictated what the path to production would be and we set a process so that we could release to production every day now release to production every day is quite a lofty goal sometimes it's not even necessary but we set this in place because we knew we wouldn't have features that go live every day but we knew that in case there are issues we need to have the confidence of a pretty robust pipeline that can push the fixes out um so by the end of 11 months we had a process and the tools in place so that we could actually push the changes to production every day which kind of guaranteed to us that in case there is an issue we have a pretty good framework that will help us recover from the issue under a couple of hours mm -hmm. um so now uh, we'll switch to axel a little bit um so we have a pretty good framework and uh, you know everything is going as according to plan but if i actually rewind a little bit and go back to like the start of the product uh, setup product build when we were talking about okay what is this platform that we want to build there were a lot of interesting questions that came out you know a lot of the questions were about okay um so the product was actually uh, they had a presence the company they already had a presence in singapore they had a product in singapore china and hong kong and they were looking at expanding to geographies in that region like right? regional expansion right so a lot of the questions that came out were like um how do we release to different geographies can we take the same product and release it and launch it in indonesia or philippines uh what do we do because uh, data privacy data residency laws are different in these countries <coughs> sorry what does that mean to our build um and then there were like some really crazy ideas about using different vendor integrations in different regions like uh, for example in china i want to integrate with labs so that they can directly upload test results to our platform which brings like a whole different um thing into focus right like we started to we had to think about like uh, these are confidential health records how do you maintain security privacy and what are vendor integrations like different geographies might have different types of integrations are these going to be via apis data dumps data sinks we don't know um and then they talked about can we make it an e-commerce platform can we start selling health products on this platform right the ideas would it stop coming and it was really great because um it was everybody was like really curious and really uh, excited to see uh, the extent this platform could grow into 
for us as an engineering team, this was also really interesting to know because some of this gave us an insight into where the product vision is headed. And we could actually plan to scale some of these ahead of time and some of these later in time. So for example, the different geographies question, we actually had to take it into account right at the start because if you had to change a cloud provider nine months after we started building, that's going to be a lot of money and effort. But some things like vendor integrations or e-commerce products, we could actually say with confidence that, you know, that's actually just like building a new feature. So it's okay. It wouldn't have too much impact on our technology decisions. But it was actually really important for tech and product and business to be engaged in this conversation together. So we could, you know, plan to scale in different phases, in different speeds. Having said that, uh, that kind of like led us to thinking about the right technology choices to use. So, you know, uh, they, the monolith that I spoke about earlier, um, that was uh, built in .NET. And there's a lot of bad rep for .NET, but I like .NET. And we decided to continue using .NET because the existing developers, they already were skilled in .NET. We could use their help. Uh, we could actually salvage an insurance engine, which was in .NET, and reuse it, repurpose it in the second part of the build. Um, we, but we also were very clear that it should not like kill innovation or modern idea. So we, you know, we, we pivoted a little bit. We used .NET Core. So, you know, we could do like containers. We could uh, automate it and deploy it to cloud with very less hassle. Uh, we used containers because, like I mentioned before, we wanted to go to different geographies. So instead of like a full dependency on Azure as a platform, we used Kubernetes to reduce that dependency. But we also it also helped us have like very fast, very scalable deployments. And we used infrastructure as code so that we could automate at scale for a platform at scale. So depending on the context, I think it's really, really important to choose the right technology that will help us scale at the right pace. Now that the right tools are in place and the right technologies are in place, we then started thinking about what is the right sort of teams that we wanted to build. And I'll hand over to Sneha to talk about that a little bit more. Thanks. Um, so you can do everything right, right? You can have a great roadmap. Um, you can make all the right tech choices, uh, but none of that will matter unless you've got the right team in place. Um, and the way we split up the team was also geared for scale. Um, each team was uh, completely cross-functional so that they could be independent. Um, and every team had a very clear objective, uh, which they were supposed to go after, uh, which was mapped to a user goal from the lean value tree that I shared earlier. Um, so we could split out, for example, a health team, right? Uh, and their objective was to make sure that users are frequently engaging with the app uh, and checking out their health score. Uh, so the health team had complete autonomy to experiment with you know, how they, what they want to build and how they want to build it in order to get to that objective. Uh, and we measured the effectiveness by tracking the measures of success that we put against that goal uh, in the lean value tree. Uh, another team was responsible for shop, which is the purchase flow, uh, making sure they were recommending the right products uh, and uh, enabling customers to complete the flow uh, well. Um, and a third team was called the claims team, um, whose job was to collect and process claims efficiently and integrate with you know, third party uh, claims adjudication um, services. Uh, and processing time for the claims was their measure of success. Um, and we had other personas that we had to build teams for, uh, which I've not mentioned so far. Employees were one uh, set of uh, users, but we also had other users in the form of you know, HR admins, right? And in an organization, when a lot of people join the company, you want to make sure that those people are onboarded onto this insurance uh, portal uh, or when they leave, they're, uh, they're uh, offboarded, right? Um, so we had to build uh, a team that focused on the HR admins uh, side of uh, the, uh, actions. Uh, similarly, we had a customer support uh, admin, uh, which was another persona, and the team building that portal was measured by how quickly it was possible to resolve a customer's, uh, like a, a, a query that was raised. Um, we also made sure to uh, keep our teams very reconfigurable so that if an objective changed, and it will because the LVT was designed for, uh, you know, a dynamic roadmap, right? So objectives can change. We have to be able to reorganize the teams very quickly uh, and, and, you know, still make them as effective, right? Um, so halfway through this, through building this platform, the InsurTech company realized that we'd been focusing so much on employees that we'd missed out on a very large customer segment, which is these employees' dependents who are covered by the same policy. Um, and so then they said, we've got to build an app that dependents can use uh, because there are some aspects of the uh, flow that uh, apply only to dependents. It's a subset of the larger um, employees' uh, uh, flow, right? The user flow. Um, so what we did was very quickly spin up a team, right? We got two people from the health team, two people from the claims team, two people from the uh, shop team. Uh, and because they already had context uh, of what was built, and so they could very quickly reuse the blocks of code that uh, we could put together and create a dependent app. And we created a dependent app in about six weeks uh, because that context was already there that we could leverage. Um, so in this way, you know, we were able to keep the teams very agile 
uh, and uh, and it helped a lot that you know we were also giving people ownership of objectives right so they could find the best way to get to those objectives as long as those objectives tied up to the larger vision um, that the that the company held um, next one please um, another way for an organization to scale is to hire the right capabilities at the right time and as i said we shifted the focus from being uh, you know for this business being insurance uh, to being health tracking so that prompted us to bring on people who had some experience in healthcare so at one point we even brought a doctor on uh, and because we were setting up for large scale and we knew we wanted to reach a million more users um, we also hired infrastructure engineers right so that they can set up expandable infra so that as and when we build the platform out and we reach more customers the infrastructure can scale as well um, and so we hired pragmatically and we also focused on speeding up their ramp up time so that they can hit the ground running and so splitting up the the monolith code base uh, into smaller microservices was actually really useful not only for you know the for the reasons that archana said but also for people to ramp up very quickly because they only had to get context of the code base uh, the microservice that they would be responsible for and not worry about you know trying to make sense of the whole large code base right uh, and so they could contribute very quickly after joining the team um, and these measures are really important right taking these steps is quite important to, to expand the organization itself and be better placed to expand customer reach so by splitting teams up we were able to give uh, ownership uh, earlier on even to new hires Uh, because they're able to ramp up very quickly, have a very focused goal, uh, and you know get get to quick wins very fast. Um, and so next, please. Uh, everything we've talked about so far, right? We've talked about measuring, uh, capturing the right data, measuring, uh, you know, how users are reacting and uh, and uh, adjusting, you know, our direction. Uh, we've talked about having a roadmap that is experimental in nature, so that we have, you know, an experimental mindset when we're uh, when we're putting it together. and we're able to take some risks right we're able to take some bets and then backtrack if we're not if those don't pan out uh we're talking about an operating model that um, that has to change so that we can reach exponentially more customers uh, and the distribution model in this case was that operating model that we brought in and at the heart of it all is uh, a strong engineering culture right building the right team having clear objectives but all of this cannot be done one at a time right these are all things that have to happen in parallel and like i said at the start Uh, this journey is never going to be linear uh, you will never have a clear set of stages these things have to happen um, together and in tandem with each other um, and that's i think our most critical takeaway from the experiences that we've had uh, building multiple such platforms uh, for scale and with that uh, we wrap up today uh, thank you all for listening we see there's a bunch of questions uh, in um, the q and a box uh, we've answered a few as we've gone but we Uh, if we've got the time, we can take some now, or you can join us. I think in the hangout. Um, Jitain, what do you think we should do? Yeah, so I think we have uh, one minute. So basically, if you can answer a few questions from Q&A. Sure. Sure. Um, uh, actually, I want to take that first one about um, the DBs. Um, the DBs. Um. I got to it now. Oh, I think I answered a few. So maybe right. I'll take the first one here. Uh critical challenges and how these were addressed during the transformation. I can cover a few snake how you can go to. Um so I think there were a uh, lots of challenges in terms of uh, uh, like switching technology, you know, like we had questions from day one about should we use react and um, should we use typescript, should we use javascript and um, how do we carve out the microservices how do we make sure that the boundaries don't leak you know like how don't we how do we make sure that we add just uh, the requisite amount of functionality into each service um but also uh, in addition to like all the technical challenges we were also like you know um, grooming a pretty young team and um, the client team and our team were coming together so there were quite a lot of like cultural differences and we had learned to work with each other and coexist in that ecosystem um so there were a lot of challenges that i think we overcame um stay high anything that i you would like to add yeah i think in general just as a cultural sort of thing right they were a company that was very uh, business led very domain led uh, and for them to think of the tech platform as the driver of their business took a massive change of mindset itself so i think that was hard to do uh, and we had to give them early feedback on that right to show them results early so that they could see the power that a platform is able to unlock for them uh thanks neha and thanks archana uh, for sharing your experience with us today uh, these are these are really valuable uh, uh, you know session which i think people will be taking away thanks neha and thanks archana very much thanks everyone for having us thank you